Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up this week's theme with a bit of a Black Sabbath situation. We have Grandma's Catacomb presenting Grandma's Catacomb from the album Grandma's Catacomb. This is, uh, I don't know, it always tickles me. When there is the synergy between everything, when the song, the album, and the artist all share a name. That's just, I don't know, it cracks me up. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's great. Alright, let's dive into this. Uh, they're not on Spotify. They're not on you. Are they on YouTube? I think they might be on YouTube. We're going to be listening to a Bandcamp version, though, just to get a little bit more higher quality than the YouTube version. Let's dive into this, see what's going on with Grandma's Catacombs. Slightly over 60 BPM. That MIDI choir, I think it would sound out of place in a lot of songs, but here it works. That door creak, oh, the chimes. Why does this work so well? The bells with that tuba? I don't know what kind of bassy instrument that was. The counterplay between their moving parts was so good. Being scolded by an old lady. It's been so long since you came to visit your poor old grandma. You know, if you wanted to stay the night, I've specially prepared the catacomb. I mean, a guest bedroom. <laughs> Even the dissonance in that bell melody is fine. Okay, as I say that, they really took it to another level. thrown in there. Now they're detuning some of the synths. Why is this so fun? <laughs> okay, that was a joy. That was a blast. I'm glad we got to wrap the week up on that. Um, <laughs> oh, man. I don't remember who requested that. But uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Is the rest of the album like that?
it's uh what do we got here comfy synth dark dungeon synth. okay so i've heard dungeon synth before we've heard not a lot of that but some of it on the channel this is their debut self-titled release eerie humorous and sometimes macabre yeah you know i could i could use those words to describe this as well this is from november 2020 Yeah, if, oh, this is the opening track too, so if this sets the tone for the whole album, <laughs> yes, 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 um, dude, it's just so good, why is it good, okay, okay, this is what, we, we come to the channel, so I tell you why things are good, or bad sometimes, I don't do that too often though, this thing is, I call it a thing because I don't know what it, it's music, right? Obviously, but like, what genre? What is comfy synth? It is kind of dungeon synth, but it it's kind of lacking the dungeony side. It's it's a low. It's not even lo-fi. Like I kind of associate mid-fi with dungeon synth, but this is very high fidelity, layered, beautiful counterpoints writing. Like that's the thing. Every tone in here feels old. This is like a synth library mimicking the sounds of like the types of virtual instruments we had in the early 2000s. Nothing in here really sounds right. It all kind of has a MIDI flair to it. But that all kind of creates a very specific cozy nostalgic atmosphere in a way. <laughs> And I think it's interesting to warp that nostalgia by introducing all of these tense, eerie, ominous harmonies around it. Parts of this song make me think, oh, yeah. You know, the music in the 2000s wasn't great, but I have a soft spot for that, for that sound. You know, it's kind of like, well, honestly, from the same era, that early 2000s CGI whether we're talking about CGI put into live action or like the CGI that we were getting for kids cartoons and film uh, stuff like hoodwinked I love the look of that film even though it's quite inferior to what came out after and even kind of inferior to the animation of more refined production houses like Pixar at the time um, it's it's just a really rough like relic of its time and and I feel that same way to this early MIDI library stuff that's going on here. But to take that nostalgia and and warp it into fear, into ominous sounds, that's wild. I don't know if the nostalgia is definitely a part of this or not. And I think that nostalgia is going to wear off over time and particularly it may not be an effect for younger or even older folk maybe it's specifically me as a millennial who grew up with this type of instrumental sounds in my teenage years that has me being a bit more uh, receptive to it today but to me this is a song well also the idea of going to grandma's cottage having an old lady say this kind of stuff to me and it kind of feel like I'm coming to an old person's home and there's all this nostalgia of sound around it. So like to me, again, I don't know if this was the intention, but it, it feels comfy. And then you realize that the emotion of the song, not on its sonic characteristics, but the, the chordal characteristics, the harmony of it, that is very not comfy. It's eerie, it's creepy, it's unsettling, but it doesn't go hard in that direction. There's quite a few sections that kind of get a fun, spooky vibe going on. In fact, there are multiple sections of this that remind me a lot of the uh, Grim Grinning Ghosts song um, from Disney. What is that? There, uh, It's the song that's played in the Haunted Mansion ride. I believe 
Uh, there's a lot of parts of this song that remind me of that in tone, in chord progression, even in some of the melodic writing. Not that they're copying one for one, but that they're alluding to something or in the same vein of in their melodic writing. Um, so it, it does end up being more lighthearted than anything else, but it is still nostalgia and fear mixed for me, which is a bizarre, absurd <laughs> combination. Um, the other thing that really stands out to me, though, here is, is the layers, how everything works together. I talked about uh, the beginning. We had like two or three bell sounds coming in, a glockenspiel and maybe a triangle, uh, maybe vertical bells. Um, and they were all dancing around each other rhythmically because you can't really hold out a note like you would on a, an aerophone or a piano or a guitar or something. You just kind of hit it and you get that initial attack and then the reverberance of it, the natural decay fade out. You don't hold the tone out though. And so there is a very direct attack on them because they're percussion instruments. And so there is a rhythmic playfulness between the three of them, but there's also pitched movements, and all three of them are doing their own melodies. And so we have this really cool counterpoint playfulness between these instruments, and we actually see this quite a few times on the, uh, the song, where multiple instruments will all be playing melodies that are kind of distinct from each other, but rhythmically and melodically dancing around. It's really beautiful listening to the way they get layered up, but then there's everything that goes on around it. Uh, any sort of light percussion work. I don't think we heard any full drum kit in here. Maybe. If so, I completely missed it. I was paying attention to all the melodic stuff going on. Uh, we also have lower synths and organs and what seemed like maybe a tuba and a cello in here. Again, a bunch of MIDI-esque library sounds. So amalgamation of these instruments. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, we have the low end stuff and they're not just playing root tones either. They're kind of getting in on some of the action too. Um, and then in and around all of this playfulness, we also have the old lady voice at the beginning. And so I think even without that, the song works great structurally this just adds another layer to it. This isn't just background music to be behind the main scene of this old lady talking to us. This is pure music that just happens to have spoken word on top of it. I, I love that combination. Um, I don't dislike it entirely when we have more narrative directed vocal work in music and so the music takes more of a background seat kind of treating it more like a film um, or treating itself more like a film but I really love this where just because someone's talking doesn't mean that there's no musical focus anymore that the music is secondary to it it all ends up working really well interweaving with all the other aspects of the song creating something that is very dense and complex but it's not just a plethora of sounds that we have, or it's not just a plethora of lines and melodies and rhythms that we have. It's also a plethora of sounds. I jumped the gun on that. Uh, <laughs> there's so many different instruments in here. I mean, I've named six or seven already. Um, and then there's just, so, we have the choir, right? A very 2000s MIDI choir, but we have a choir in here. And I think that elevates most of the sections to it. It kind of, well, it elevates it in that I think it improves it, but it, it grounds it. The song, I think, could really reach a level of, of campiness um, and a lot of the lighter, brighter metallic tones in here from all the bells and glockenspiels can certainly kind of cause the, the song to levitate a little bit, rise up off the ground, and the choir and especially the cello and the tuba kind of grab the song and keep it rooted, keep it grounded, and, and don't allow it to move into any sort of uh, overly fantastic realm that I think would break any sort of suspension of, of belief. Or susp suspension of disbelief. There we go. And it kind of keeps everything feeling more normal, less heightened, less over-exaggerated. And I like that. It's uh, it's a very measured writing style, knowing that it's 
a bit wild and absurd in a lot of ways, campy in others, uh, and finding ways to balance those out with more serious components to it uh, in a way that ultimately works. You know, there are definitely some parts that got me chuckling way beyond campy or absurd ideas. Uh, and to me, there's no way around it. You just have to embrace those moments. But they don't allow those moments to dominate the song. Almost as fast as they've come up and, and surprised me with how absurd the song can be, it immediately returns back to something a bit more serious in its composition or overall sound or atmosphere in order to not allow the song to lift off and float away with its odd choices at times. Or it's just odd concept. Like, this whole thing as, a, as an entirety, shouldn't it really exist? There's no reason this should work as well as it does, but it, it does work very well. Um, and I, like I said, I think a lot of it is a balancing act. Now, the last thing I want to touch on is harmonic qualities. There's a lot of darkness in here, a lot of eeriness. It comes through chord progression it comes through instrumental tone, uh, that low tuba sound, the constant cello-esque sound at the bottom of the song. They have some darker tones to them, but we also have the harmonies, the chord progressions that introduce darkness. We have melodies that kind of bounce around with this darkness. They're very light and dexterous while not alluding to anything bright harmonically. This, I think, is what gives it that fun kind of Disney-esque spooky sound where it uh, is kind of creepy, but it's a fun, safe kind of creepy. Those aren't the only types of ominous moments in it, but I think any time that those instruments are present and that melodic writing is used, it kind of creates a bit of levity to those moments, and I think kind of places the tongue firmly in cheek and goes along with the idea of this old lady and a cottage and most likely a catacomb underneath it. <laughs> like, it's an absurd concept mixed with some absurd music. You have to go into there with a bit of fun in mind, and uh, they do that. Very well. Um, but there's the other thing that is the elephant in the room. Something that leans into the end of the song being worse than the beginning. and Not like worse that it was less listenable, but worse in that it was uh, more eerie, more scary, more complex. And, and that's harmonic dissonance. We had the synth come in and start engaging with dissonance. Uh, a couple of times every five or six notes, we might punctuate that phrase with a dissonant dyad. Eventually, those dyads became the movement. Every part of the melody was a, a dissonant group of two notes that just did not want to play well with each other. And then eventually, we kind of moved into rhythmic dissonance too as the synth continued to play faster and sloppier with more tension between the notes and it just became chaotic and unruly in a lot of ways that's how the song wraps up is taking all of this fun energy and kind of wrapping it into something a bit more twisted and sinister whereas the beginning i would describe as ominous i think sinister is a good way to describe the ending of it and I think that might actually work well with the uh, lyrics, which I'm going to dive into now, but I, I wager the lyrics might start off a little fun, but they dive into more serious matter by the end of it, which is why the music also goes in that direction. So let me look that up, see what's going on there, and then we'll continue this discussion. All right, so I couldn't find any lyrics, so I listened to the song again, which was a blast because I enjoy that song. <laughs> But also because I picked up on a couple of new things. First of all, I completely forgot about all of the sound effects of it all. I was focusing on the musicality of it more than the atmosphere. But, I mean, the door opening, the sound of, like, machinery and, and steam-powered machines, the smoke, stuff like that. Um, just this constant pounding on every other beat, which was... A, a great rhythmic device in there, but also felt like machinery. Um, there's just a lot of... I don't think that they're sound effects in general. I think they are 
instruments. They're just used in very effective ways. Uh, and it's just very smart usage of these instruments in, in non-traditional ways. Uh, sort of like... I bring it up. To, I feel like I bring this up too much, but it's one. Of, it's literally one of my favorite songs ever. Eric Whittaker's Ghost Train. Uh, it's an orchestral piece. Uh, it's got brass. It's got percussion. It's got woodwind. Um, and yeah, that's it, right? What do I feel like I'm missing? Oh yeah, there's no. I don't think there's any strings in it. Um, at least not in the performances I've seen. I, it can be adapted to anything. But instead of playing music, they all play sounds to make it sound like a train is barreling into uh, the station, uh, at least for the first movement. And I love stuff like that. To think outside the box of what instruments typically play, what roles they typically do, and how music is normally formed, and to create visualizations of stuff. We've also heard this in... Jeez, uh, I can't remember who it was. We did it on a channel. And they were super focused on like bird sounds. I think they were also bird watchers. It was a contemporary, was it a modern classical composer? I can't remember now. Uh, it was European though, if I remember correctly, not in a, not an American composer. Um, I don't remember what country though. But anyways, the they were doing a song about nature and like the flutes and the clarinets were doing all these little bird whistles. In, in sections and it's just very cool to envision how an instrument can work outside of the traditional uses and I think that's what's happening here and so it kind of elevates the song again for me granted it's all synthesizer stuff right we're not actually asking a an oboe player to make these interesting noises but I do believe that it's still using an oboe sound from a MIDI library to create these sounds um and I, I just, I love that. I'm a huge fan of that, especially when it works well and that the image they're trying to convey is very perfectly uh, stated to me, at least. Now, I can't speak for everyone who listens to this, but I, I very much get the idea of what this is supposed to feel like and even look like this cabin, this cottage of this, uh, this old lady. Now, lyrically, the song... You open the door of this cottage and you go in and it's grandma's house and she says, oh, it's been so long since I've seen you. Is there anything I can get for you? Maybe some blood soup or bone biscuits? Definitely going for some of that, uh, you know, cliche Halloween food. <laughs> or maybe just the idea of a witch who doesn't know any better, just has very poor social skills. Because <laughs> that's a dead giveaway. I'm not going in your house. You're obviously a witch. <laughs> bone soup. No, blood soup is even worse. At least bone soup, you know, you can argue that it's like, you know, it's, it's ham bone soup. I threw the bone in for flavor. <laughs> blood soup, though, you're not getting away with that one. <laughs> um, but then she says, uh, you know, it's, it's been so long. You're welcome to stay the night. If you'd like, I just cleaned out the catacomb. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I just cleaned out the guest room. And then the evil, wild, absurd cackle before moving into that uh, final third of the song with, uh, I think, only her laughter in it. I don't think she contributes any other story-based things. So, yeah, there's not a lot there that the music doesn't already tell, but I wanted to go into it anyways because I took the time to listen to all the <laughs> lyrics. And some sections I had to put on repeat because the uh, the vocals are rather low in the mix. And, you know, they have all this crackle to them and stuff. So it's, um, there's a lot of natural compression and stuff put on to create this old lady voice. And it's, it kind of, things get lost in the noise. But I put the work in. I wanted to talk about it. So those are my thoughts. Grandma's Catacombs by Grandma's Catacombs off of the album Grandma's Catacombs. I can't recommend this because I haven't heard the rest, but I'm going to go out on a limb that this introduces the album. If you enjoyed this, you might want to check out the rest of it. I'm going to be doing that sometime just because I'm intrigued by this concept in general and <laughs> because it's actually very cleverly written. It is good on paper. The end result is you know, awkward and absurd and comical at times. But, you know, what's on paper, it's solid. 
I really dig it. There's a lot of complexity to this that you just don't see that often. So, outside of classical. I mean, I guess this is kind of class. Anyways, I don't know, man. I don't know where this sits. I don't know what kind of music this is other than just electronic. <laughs> Those are my thoughts on this. I think I've already stated that. What are yours? Anything that stood out to you? Anything that you would like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Just, I don't know, your own perspective or opinion on things. Put all that stuff down in the comment section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree takes you here you can find links to my music ways to support the channel a link to the discord server and so much more above that if you could like subscribe and ring the bell i greatly appreciate all three of those that wraps it up for today i'll be back tomorrow though 5 p.m eastern standard time 9 p.m utc as usual we're going to check out a full well normally we check out a full album but instead we're going to check out an entire classical performance you're interested in that stick around i know the performance is like 80 minutes long but there's only four movements to it so it's still probably going to be like two and a half to three hours long of a video just like usual but i'm really excited to get into it and uh I, i've I, I think the classical reactions have been pretty receptive as well or have they, they have people have been receptive to them so i'm hoping other people are excited for this too all right, until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.